Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And I'm here today with Lily Browning, who is Hernando County's Florida Friendly Landscape Agent, and also Karen Mojica, who is with Hernando County um, Mosquito Control. And we're all gonna be talking a little bit today about some really common myths and facts in your Florida landscape. And some of these, I'm not sure if really myth is the right word for it. It's more incorrect information. So a lot of people don't, don't always assume that when somebody gives you advice, it's correct advice. But we each have a couple different little myths and facts that we're going to run through here today that apply to everybody in your landscape. So let me go ahead and turn it over to Lily, and she can go ahead and get started here. Thank you very much, Bill. And again, welcome everybody to our Myths versus Facts with your Florida landscape. As Bill said, maybe they're not all myths. Perhaps they're just misunderstandings. So we're kind of here today to bring you research-based information from the three of us who never try to sell you anything. <laughs> That's a big point too. Um, and information from your land-grant university at the University of Florida. So let's start with myth number one. Trees and shrubs should be watered as much as your lawn is watered. That um, isn't so much, it's kind of an implied myth, I guess we should say that, because our irrigation system, when it comes on, it waters everything in the landscape, um, your lawn, as well as your trees and your shrubs. The thing is that with your trees and your shrubs, once they are established, and by established, I'm going to be generous and give them a two-year establishment period. There are some places where you wouldn't need anywhere near that long, but in, in thinking of our sandier soils in some of our places, let's say they had a two-year establishment period. After that, they really should be able to, and they will be a lot happier surviving on natural rainfall. So you might be wondering, well, I don't want to turn off my irrigation system completely. What do I do about that? You can go in there and cap off um, the parts of your system that are watering your shrubs and your trees. In fact, you will shorten their lifespan if they get watered as much as your lawn does. Um, you can either totally cap them off and they'll be fine or if you still are more comfortable with them having a little bit of water from an irrigation system, you can retrofit your existing system and put in a, a micro irrigation system or a drip irrigation system. Um, I know Dr. Lester has encountered um, a number of times people who say, well, this shrub of mine just kind of withered up and died. What happened? And he would go out and literally be able to pull the shrub up out of the ground and just hear this big shrub as he did so. And what happened was it was just so wet and kind of a mixture of um, things going on. The mulch that was layered and layered and layered and layered uh, never did decompose properly and become more like soil. And it just wasn't a good situation for the shrub. The best thing is leave your trees and shrubs to thrive and they will thrive on natural rain, uh, natural rainwater. Myth number two, and this is a big one happening this time of year. I tell everyone we're gonna stop, we're gonna stop and we're gonna listen for a minute. You hear that? I hear chainsaws, that's what I hear. I hear them out there. They are out there in the community. I know they are. And those chainsaws are crate murdering all these poor crate myrtles that are out there. You see this. It's very common. I took this picture a year ago in a, a local restaurant's parking lot. I call it either death row or um, mo the row of moaning myrtles. On um, these poor things, you can see they were freshly pruned in that picture. Why do people do that? People do that because people do that. And so then they copy their neighbors. They copy uh, the professionals that they see doing it. And they 
They just think because they see it being done that it's the right thing to do. Professionals will do this. Um, well, you got to think of you know, maybe the guys who go through all of your community and why do they, you know, do all of the trees that way? They have a lot of trees to get done in a short period of time. They don't have time to be like a concierge kind of pruner, paying, paying special attention. You know, they need to get it done within a short amount of time. And it doesn't matter to them if they are only giving that great myrtle a 10-year lifespan in the so doing. <laughs> they have a job to get done and they're going to get it done. Your personal crate myrtles at your house, you probably want them to live longer than that. By severely pruning them, you take away um, their feeding ability, you know, all the starches and carbohydrates and everything in there. You take away a, what could be a beautiful winter form of a tree. And what does end up growing back each year is uh, this very new basal cell kind of whip-like growth that, yeah, they have bigger flowers, but they have fewer flowers. And you'll notice when we have some heavy rains, they just all kind of fall over. If you are considering pruning your crepe myrtle, you can go to my um, Facebook page at um, Hernando FFL Program. I have pinned to the top of it a demonstration on how to properly prune a crepe myrtle. Now, these palm trees, we're going to talk about a completely different kind of tree here. This issue is going to happen in the summer when we're expecting storms to come. Somebody took these, uh, this ring of palm trees, and I mean, it's great for our demonstration purposes here. Um, we see this done often, and someone will come to your door when, when hurricane season is approaching, and they'll say, hey, why don't you let me hurricane prune your palms? Well, we're here to tell you that hurricane pruning is not a thing. Don't even listen to that word. It is not necessary. Cabbage palms have been here in Florida longer than you or I or Ponce de Leon or anybody, and they survived a lot of hurricanes without anybody pruning them. In fact, if you prune them like these severely pruned ones in the background there, that's all that's left there is what we call the uh, spear leaf. That's its only growing point. Palms are not actually trees, believe it or not. Those are humongous grasses that you're looking at right there, plant-wise. And that is their only growing point. And if that is damaged, then the tree is dead. The uh, palm tree closest to us that we are looking at in this picture is the only properly pruned palm tree in this picture. You want to um, think of a clock in your mind. Think of nine o'clock and three o'clock and leave everything in that cone above nine and three o'clock alone. You don't even have to prune them, but if you don't like all the brown fronds and the skirt underneath, that is the proper way to prune your palm trees. Let's move on to another uh, myth that's out there. The myth that you're, you should have a sterile yard with not one living critter in it at all. <laughs> you should kill every insect that's out there. Um, that is actually, you're doing yourself a lot of harm. You're costing yourself a lot of money, not only for the product that kills everything, but you have just, if you kill everything, you have taken away your allies. Only 1% of the insects out there, and there are a lot of insects out there, only 1% of them are what we consider pests. And those pests are, you know, insects that will cause damage to the plants that we want. Only 1% of them are doing that. The other 99% are either our allies, they eat those pests, <laughs> or they outcompete those pests, or they're just kind of hanging around. They're just there. They're not causing any issues. And in fact, maybe um, they're providing a food source for the other types of wildlife that we do want in our yard. 
So Florida Friendly Landscaping recommends, number one, that you find out if your problem is an insect problem. Dr. Lester is going to cover that more when it comes to lawns. Not every lawn problem is an insect problem. First, determine if it is. Figure out what the problem is and spot treat only where that problem is. The only kind of pesticide I ever put on my yard is um, fire ant killer, like a fire ant bait, only where the fire ants are. And I always joke around and say my neighbor and I play fire ant chess and we're just moving the, the fire mounds back and forth. It's I move them to his yard and tell them it's his move and he moves them back to mine. But that's the only, you only need to spot treat. Do not broadcast spray and kill everything in your yard. Myth number four, and this one makes a lot of people frustrated and angry at me. And I, I think I'm going to make a class on the uh, stages of owning an invasive exotic plant. Once you find out you own an invasive exotic plant, I swear stage number one is denial and every person I've ever seen. No, I don't. No, it's not. That There's nothing wrong with that plant. <laughs> there's always that stage. But there's plenty of research and plenty of publications out there which will tell you and explain to you, you know, the invasive exotic plants here in Florida. We live in pretty much a greenhouse. So we've got a lot of plants that have been introduced and that have gotten out of control. I'm not saying you have to go 100% native. There are also plenty of what we call well-behaved exotics that are Florida friendly and that'll do fine in a yard. But there are also many plants, including what I'm showing you here, which can be bought in any um, big box store, it's called Mexican petunia. I've personally seen it out of control in um, undeveloped lots. So the myth that comes about after you're in denial, <laughs> then you say, well, not mine because I keep mine under control. I keep it in pots or I don't let it get out of control. I don't know. I have not met anybody yet who can control the birds and what they eat and digest and plant elsewhere. I haven't met anybody yet who can control the wind uh, for the plants that are wind pollinated. You may not see it go crazy in your yard, but it may be taken to an undeveloped lot and what it will end up doing is out competing the native plants that should be there. And therefore, I mean, some of the animals are opportunistic and can make do. Many, many, many animals are not. So you are disrupting the entire ecosystem. So as much as you may love, and I always say, you know, well, the universe did not create ugly plants. <laughs> Whether or not it's pretty has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It, and the plants never decided I'm going to leave Mexico and walk over to Florida and get out of control there. That was us. We're the ones who spread, um, you know, the invasive species around and we're the ones who need to try and get a hold of that situation. And my last myth I'm going to cover is uh, the mysterious mulch mythology. And this picture, I took it at a uh, local big box store where maybe they had some mulch spill or something, I'm not sure, but they wanted to spread it around. What you're seeing here is what we call volcano mulching. Um, they decided to do this to two palm trees and an oak tree. What you can't see in the photo is they also did it to a telephone pole. Not sure what, what they were accomplishing there other than a consistent look. Um, this would be, number one, a waste of your money because you're using a whole lot of mulch where you don't need to use that much. And actually using that much is detrimental to those trees. Several things can be going on here. It is the equivalent to planting them too deeply. And their roots are going to be looking for oxygen. And they're going to start growing the wrong way. 
and perhaps encircling the tree. Also, a um, couple things also could be happening. You could be holding too much moisture up against the trunk of the tree, inviting fungus. After a while, the opposite's going to happen, and it's going to start to like thatch together to where you have just created little umbrellas <laughs> where any kind of water just sheds off of it away from the tree, never gets to the tree at all. That oak tree in the back there should have at the bottom of it what we call a flare. Every tree should have near the bottom where it kind of starts to flare out before the roots begin. We want to, what Dr. Elmore in Pasco County, she started a movement called hashtag free the flare. We want to free that flare. Don't cover it up with mulch. So we want to use two to three inches of mulch and keep it pulled away from the trunks of our trees and our shrubs. I also have cypress mulch listed under mythology, and you may be wondering why. It's easiest to pick up in the store and it's the cheapest. It is not damaging to your plants. It is a matter of um, ethics and sustainability. Florida Friendly Landscaping does not recommend the use of cypress mulch because of the way that it is um, produced and brought to us um, for sale as mulch. They go into the uh, wetlands, cut down the young cypress trees. By the way, there's no old cypress trees left, really. Cut down the old cypress trees just to immediately shred them down and sell to us as mulch. It's not a sustainable practice. It's not a, a byproduct of the lumber industry. It's not um, like pine, which is a quick renewing resource. And there are plantations where they grow it specifically for those things. Same with eucalyptus. All those are fine. But the use of cypress mulch is discouraged for those reasons. Rubber and rock. Um, one of the jobs we want mulch to do one of them is to break down and add to, you know, the nutrient holding capacity and the water holding capacity of our sandy soils. Rubber's never going to do that. And if it does break down, we got to think about rubber breaking down in our hot sun. You know, what is, you know, what are we adding then to the soil? Could be petroleum, could be heavy metals. Um, <clears throat> and they're made from shredded tires. So also in a safety um, aspect there still could be little pieces of steel in there too. So we do not recommend the use of rubber. And if you've gone out there in the summer in Florida, you know when there's rubber mulch around because you can smell it. It smells like rubber, you know, and that's not all that pleasant either. And think of all the heat it's drawing to those plants. Now rocks. I love rocks. Dr. Lester loves rocks. <laughs> um, I suggest the use of rocks decoratively, um, but, you know, as, as accents, not as a full mulch. By the way, total mulch yards, no matter what kind of mulch you're using, without very many plants, are never considered Florida-friendly. Um, rocks might be great to use uh, you know in beds as total mulch up north but down here they just draw too much heat and again you're not it's not breaking down and adding anything good to the soil <clears throat> now i know a lot of people worry about mulch and termites mulch and roaches and other gross things that might be in the mulch let's discuss termites first I really hate to break this news to you if you are fairly new to Florida, but if you go out in your yard and you start looking around, you're going to find termites. They are ubiquitous in our soil. Um, what you can do with mulch and what I have heard recommended is make sure that there is nothing right up against your house. Nothing really but bare sand because that for about eight inches because that discourages termites being able to get to your house. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but it 
if it's going to happen, it's going to happen whether you have mulch or not. That's, I guess, the point that I'm getting at. But you can reduce it coming from the mulch if you keep a barrier of just like the Sahara Desert for the termite between the mulch and your house. Roaches and other things, sure, there are sometimes roaches in mulch, and some people get grossed out by that, but there's not near as many if you don't have that mulch too wet. A lot, what I hear complaints about roaches and mulch is that it's at people's front doors. Of course, that's where they're going to complain the most, and that's where they spend the most time. But also, let's go back to that irrigation system. Remember I told you to cap it off um, around your shrubs and your beds? so that it doesn't get too wet there and will not be as attractive to those roaches and those other <laughs> gross things. Okay, I'm gonna screen share for Karen Bill. I don't know if you can show her or how that will work. Hello. We'll let Karen start now. All right, hi everyone, my name is Karen. I'm from Hernando County Mosquito Control and I'm gonna go over a few myths that, or non-truths that we have. Um, come across quite a bit. Um, our first one is that all mosquitoes bite. Um, it may feel like all mosquitoes bite, but really only the females bite. Um, after they hatch the females, it's in there, they have to find a blood meal in order to get the proteins needed to produce those eggs. So that's something they're, they know automatic as soon as they're born, they're gonna be out there looking for uh, human, an animal, uh, something that they can get that blood meal from so they can get those proteins to produce the eggs and reproduce. The males do not, they have no need for a blood uh, protein meal. So they actually go out and they, uh, they eat nectar. So they're actually, that's, that is a positive of a mosquito. They, uh, they're pollinators. So the males will go out and they just feed off of nectar. So, that is our first myth there. Um, they don't all bite. But if you are getting bit or you are having, um, you know, an, an abundance, of course, let us know that so we can help you. Um, but also the best thing to do is make sure you have on long sleeves, which is hard in Florida. Um, make sure you have on your repellent. I have a little bit here to show it. There's a uh, DEET is always a great thing. And um, we've also gotten, um, we've had a lot of complaints uh, on the shoreline for the noceums. We don't spray for noceums here in Hernando County. Um, they're not a disease vector. They're not a disease carrier, I'm sorry. Um, so we do not, that's not part of our, our uh, procedures here. But if you are experiencing some noceums, we found that some, let me try to get this in the screen here, some have been having good luck using this product, which is also good for mosquitoes or for noceums. Um, and you can give that a try. They do sell that in the box stores. Um, so yeah, that's my first myth. It's only the females that you gotta watch for. Myth number two um, that we have is that mosquitoes need a lot of water to breed and to hatch. We do get a lot of calls from people who say, you know, there's a large body of water and, you know, we're getting mosquitoes out here and we do go out and inspect and treat that for them. However, they can breed in something as small as this bottle cap. Um, after a rain, your little bottle cap in your yard that you don't really even notice is there has filled up with water. Those female mosquitoes will lay their eggs in that water. Um, and that is a nice little convenient spot for them to, to breed those larvae and um, grow into an adult mosquito. So it doesn't need to have a lot of water. So what we always ask is a few days after a rain, go out in your yard and find any areas that could be holding even just a little bit of water. Um, some of the things our technicians come across is uh, water pooled on, on say a tarp, um, a bird bath, your rain gutters, they hold a lot of water after a rain and if they're clogged or backed up in any way, that is a great breeding ground. Um, you don't even see it, unfortunately. Um, so after a rain, go out the bases of your plants, the, sa the saucer bottom that holds that water. Um, if you ever notice, you go out there and you'll see those little wiggly things in there. Those are mosquitoes. Um, just dump them out. 
a mosquito has to live in the water until it becomes a flying adult. So the larvae and the pupae uh, go through about four, depending on the weather. When it's hotter, it's quicker. Um, but usually it's about five days that they're living in the water before they hatch. If you dump that water, you have prevented the cycle and they will not hatch. So by going out uh, after a rain, we can eliminate those um, mosquitoes from continuing their process. The um, other things that we find, well, first of all, I'll go over really quick. We are a department within the county. We have technicians that um, are well-trained and they go out uh, whenever we're experiencing problems within the county. If we get a phone call or if we know of certain problem areas, they go out and they inspect that area and treat it accordingly. Um, of course, we, we, if it's a water body, we use a biological product to prevent those mosquitoes from breeding. But we ask that residents, because we don't always know what's going on in people's yards, we ask if you're having a mosquito problem to please give us a call because that tells us where we need to, to look and to find. And it's not always something in your yard. Uh, sometimes you have a vacant lot next door. It could be a piece of debris in there that's just holding that water. Sometimes it's even nature. Uh, tree holes can hold water. We have, I have here another visual. Um, we have these uh, bromeliads, which can bloom into beautiful flowers. And this tends to be a very common spot, uh, especially newcomers to Florida. They don't realize that in the center, well, let me find it again. In the center of this plant is almost like a cup. And after a rain, it holds sometimes up to like eight ounces of water in there. And it's a great hiding um, dark place for the mosquitoes to lay their eggs. So if you do have bromeliads, um, you, like I said, you'll sometimes see that really pretty pink or red flower. It'll come out through the middle. Um, it's very hard to maintain them. But if you do have them, please hose them out at least once a week to prevent those uh, eggs from hatching in there. If you can't hose them out, there are granules you can sprinkle in there and that'll keep them um, from hatching in there as well. Um, a lot of times our residents tend to just remove them because it, it makes their life a little bit miserable having mosquitoes and always maintaining them. And that um, also goes as well for bird baths. Bird baths are another big spot that, of course, we leave the water there for the birds. But if you don't clean it out and brush the sides, that's another uh, big spot for the mosquitoes to lay. And those mosquitoes are smart. They'll lay the eggs up on the edge at the top, wait for the water, the rain to come. As soon as that rain hits those eggs, there they go. They'll hatch. And um, so if you don't like cleaning that out and you're not going to be able to brush it, you may want to second think that. Or you can also use the granules. They have granules that are safe for fish, for birds, um, but yet will prevent that larvae from hatching into an adult. Um, another um, thing I just want to go over quick too is uh, junk tires. If you have tires or you know of disposed tires that are near your home, those tires are a real um, another great hiding spot for mosquitoes to live, breed, and uh, really advance uh, the population in your area. So if you have any spare tires that you no longer use, they're junk tires, you just haven't had the chance to dispose of them, we have our Tire Amnesty Day, and that's coming up on January 23rd of 2021. It is a Saturday at the Hernando County Fairgrounds. We do this usually once a year. Um, we get some tractor trailers out there and it gives the opportunity for the residents of the county to bring those tires free of charge to dispose of them properly and eliminate that um, disease causing problem. Now, um, they have to have no rims and we don't take the tires that are from commercial businesses. This is homeowners. Um, we've had some great homeowners in the past who live near a walking trail. They've actually gone out and collected some that they found in the woods near their home and were able to bring them over there and, and just clean it up a little bit. So um, the last few years, we've been able to do this once a year. If you're unable to get there on that day, the landfill does take 
up to eight tires per year at no charge. Um, and you can bring them to the landfill as well. But if you have an abundance of them or you just happen to have them ready for that weekend of the 23rd of January, just bring them over to the Hernando County Fairgrounds on Route 41 and we'll be happy to assist you with that. Um, and I know, oh, there was one other thing too. If you have water that you have in your yard, say a large animal trough, a fish pond, decorative water fountain, if that water sits still, um, it's going to breed. We do have fish here that can help you to maintain that water. Um, the animal troughs, they, the fish will go down to the bottom when they drink, just as if they were living in a lake or a pond. Um, these are natural fish to our environment, but they are very good at eating mosquito larvae. So if you do have large animal troughs or a fountain, just give our office a call. Our guys will bring out some fish for you. They'll put them in your water area and that'll keep your uh, home mosquito free for you from that environment. So that is my no need for a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. I have a couple more uh, myths to go through here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So a couple myths versus facts out in the landscape. Number one, you have to remember that the members of your Facebook gardening group are not necessarily garden experts. A lot of people are very involved on Facebook and over the last couple of years, Facebook groups have really grown in popularity and it could be a great way to get to meet people and pick up some helpful tips and information and good way to get advice. But the advice isn't necessarily always correct because as a part of my job, I'm involved in a lot of different Facebook groups. And sometimes I see the questions, the pictures, the conversation, and sometimes the information is just nowhere near correct. So here's one good example of that. This is from um, a Facebook group and somebody posted a picture of their front lawn on there. And this was during the winter. And they said that uh, they were told that they had a fungus in their yard. And it always seems to come back every year during the winter, which kind of sets off, you know, an idea in my head of what it could be. I always thought it was due to the grass going dormant. Is this true? So if you were to send a picture like this to me and ask, you know, Bill, what do you think is wrong with my lawn? There's about 10 different things that it could be. I can't make any kind of definite determination from just a picture like this. It does narrow it down. There's a good chance that it's a fungal disease. We have uh, several different fungal problems in St. Augustine lawns here in Central Florida. One of them is much more dominant during the summer. That's called take all root rot. Because this was during the winter, it might be brown patch. But some of the responses on this, some people did correctly um, say that it was brown patch. And that's probably what it was. But like I said, I couldn't say for sure. Other people pointed out that cultural practices, things like cutting your lawn at the proper height, proper irrigation, go a long way towards helping with diseases and keeping your lawn looking good. And that is very, very true. Cultural practices are very important to maintain a healthy lawn. But I saw one response from somebody who said, try a cheap fungus killer like cinnamon. Go to Sam's, buy a big container, sprinkle the fungus area with the entire container, wait a few weeks, and then do it again. Well, sure enough, if you go to um, Sam's or Costco, they do sell cinnamon in large containers. And if you were to dump this on your front lawn, your lawn would smell great. I mean, the whole neighborhood would stand up and take notice of your yard, but that is not a recommended control for any kind of fungal disease in your lawn and probably would not help a whole lot with that big brown area in the lawn and would not be a very good cure. It would smell great, but not very effective. So don't always assume that the information you're getting from strangers on Facebook is gonna be correct. 
Another common myth is everybody who has a St. Augustine lawn seems to think that when they do have a dead spot or a brown spot in their yard, it's caused by chinch bugs. And chinch bugs are a very, very tiny little insect here in Florida that feeds on St. Augustine lawns. And they can be very damaging. And sometimes in the summer, the heat of summer, their populations build up. Um, you have to really get down on your hands and knees or dig up a little sample of your lawn and look under a microscope because these insects are each about the size of a grain of pepper, so they're very small. But you can't just assume that every dead spot near St. Augustine is caused by, caused by chinch bugs. So if you have a little section of your St. Augustine turf and it looks like this, it's brown with maybe a little bit of green still left, that is a picture of what the chinch bugs look like. And like I said, they're very tiny, the size of a grain of pepper. So you can't just stand there 20 feet away and your neighbor can't and your lawn service can't and say for sure you have chinch bugs because there are a lot of different problems that could cause a situation like this in your lawn. Some of the possible causes might be broken irrigation. You might have a broken sprinkler head or sprinkler head that's just kind of knocked out of whack. So it's not watering the area it should be. Instead, it's watering the side of your house or your car, your driveway. It could have been caused by herbicide burn or fertilizer burn. You have to be very careful using any kind of herbicide or weed killer, especially during the summer, because if you put it down when it's too hot, it could kill a section of your lawn. And of course, that information is on the package directions. You just have to read them. It could be caused by a disease. It could even be caused by pet urine. If you have a dog or maybe your neighbor walks their dog past your house, and they take care of business in the same spot every day, <clears throat> it can eventually cause a brown spot or a dead spot. Could be too much traffic, too many people walking on it, driving on it, backing a trailer over it, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different things that could cause a dead spot in your St. Augustine lawn. But unfortunately, a lot of people just always assume it's chinch bugs. And unless you actually take a one square foot sample of that lawn, and check it for chinch bugs to see if you have them. And if you do how many you have, you're never gonna know for sure whether your problem is chinch bugs or one of these other possibilities. So myth number three is natural products are going to safely solve all your lawn and garden problems. So here's another screenshot from a different um, Facebook group. And somebody asked, I got some neem oil, which is a very commonly used, it can be used as an insecticide. It is effective on certain insects. It also works to a certain extent on certain diseases. So it can be used as a fungicide sometimes also. But this person got some neem oil to use on their plants for bugs and snails. No clue how much per gallon of water. Can somebody help please? Well, if you buy any brand or variety of neem oil or anything else that's labeled to be used as some type of pesticide, it will have a label and it has all the directions and all the safety information you need to know right on the label. So obviously this person probably would have benefited from actually reading the label on the package of neem oil because it would tell them how much of that product to add per gallon of water. It would also tell them what insects it is effective on uh, whether it's effective on snails or not, but sometimes people assume that a, uh, a natural product can be used any way you want to use it and it's going to be effective on everything, whereas anything from neem oil or any other kind of homemade concoction may be effective on a few different problems, but not on a wide variety of ones. So neem oil will be effective um, for certain insects, it does not control caterpillars and it doesn't control many different fungal diseases either. Neem oil, you have to be very careful using it during summer. And this is something that I rarely see mentioned, but you need to keep in mind. If it's very hot and sunny outside, as it is from, let's say, beginning of April all the way through October, if you spray any kind of oil spray on your plants, you could basically fry them. It looks like they got sunburn really bad and the leaves will turn brown and dry out and you'll seriously damage your plants. 
Um, neem oil does not control imaginary insects. And by imaginary insects, sometimes people assume their problem is an insect. Even if they can't find the insect, they don't know what it looks like. They can't get it identified. They just assume, oh, my plant has something wrong with it. It must be an insect. So therefore, I'm going to spray neem oil or some other kind of insecticide on it. Neem oil does not work well on imaginary insects, and it doesn't solve problems that can be caused like by growing the wrong plant in the wrong place. Doesn't solve problems that involve poor soil, incorrect fertilizing, or wrong pH. These are all potential problems that are going to cause your plant to grow poorly and have problems. So don't just assume that it's always an insect causing those problems. Now, another very commonly used um, homemade concoction that we really don't recommend for a number of different reasons is using vinegar as a natural herbicide or weed killer. There are people who advocate you mixing vinegar and Epsom salts and a little bit of water. And they say, if you spray that on weeds, it's totally safe. It's all natural. It's going to work great. It's going to kill the weeds. The problem is it rarely works well at all. But here's somebody else in a different Facebook gardening group who asked the question. I've heard of people using vinegar as a natural herbicide. Does anyone have any personal experience with it? I have a flower bed that is free of plants, but, and this is the important part, accumulated a massive amount of weeds that would be difficult to remove by hand. I want to replace that area. I'm concerned vinegar may alter the soil and affect the health of the new plants. Does anybody have any information? And of course, there are a lot of responses to this question that were kind of here and there and all over the place. But the truth of the matter is, that using vinegar and Epsom salt as an herbicide, number one, none of those products is labeled to be used as a weed killer. So there's no directions, there's no mixing instructions, there's no safety directions. Uh, using vinegar of any type only works on very, very tiny reeds, ones that have just sprouted, and it only works on certain species of weeds. So it may kill a couple weeds, but there's certain other types of weeds that are just completely immune to it. Now, if you look online, there are types of vinegar that are used um, for commercial agriculture, because if you go to the grocery store or look in your pantry, the bottle of vinegar that you have is maybe 6% acidity. You can purchase vinegar that's used um, as an herbicide, and it's about 20% acidity. But at that strength, it's also dangerous. You have to be very careful to use gloves, not breathe it in directly. It does have a, uh, labeled directions about how to mix it and safety precautions that you could take. But even then, I've heard from people who have tried using the commercial strains of vinegar as an herbicide. Even they say that product doesn't work very well. So there's a good chance that you're going to be at least somewhat disappointed using vinegar unless your weeds have just sprouted and are maybe a quarter inch tall at best. So myth number four, the best cure for lawn problems is to water more. A lot of times I hear from people that they're having a problem with their lawn. It's brown. They have a dead spot, some other kind of issue. And they seem to think that if they can water more, it's going to fix all their problems. Well, remember, we're talking about trying to grow turf grass here, not rice. And the last couple of years here in Hernando County, at least, we've had anywhere from average rainfall to slightly higher than average rainfall. So we get a good amount of rain every year. Plus, in Hernando County, you are allowed to irrigate your lawn once a week, only once. So if you irrigate once a week and we get any kind of rainfall at all for an otherwise healthy lawn, that should be an adequate amount of water and you shouldn't have an issue with too little water in your lawn. The problem is if you have some kind of underlying problem with your lawn, uh, improperly or undiagnosed disease, insect problem, poor fertilization, uh, driving on the lawn too much, something like that, then a damaged lawn is still going to suffer no matter how much water you put on. So don't think that more water is going to solve all your problems because it rarely does. 
So when you do water your lawn once a week, and remember, no more than once a week, if you put down anywhere from one half an inch to three quarters of an inch each time, that gets you almost all the way there towards the amount of water that lawn needs per week. And normally natural rainfall is going to make up the difference. So number five, and my final myth here today out in your lawn and garden is the second best cure for lawn problems after more water is more fertilizer. So people seem to think if their lawn is not growing well, it's suffering, it's brown. If they water it more and put a bunch more fertilizer on it, that's going to solve everything. And that's what the lawn really needs to do well and look good. Well, applying more fertilizer is honestly never the correct solution. I can't think of an instance where somebody presented me with a lawn question or I diagnosed somebody's lawn and the advice I came up with was to go home and fertilize more. What it does is sometimes it is a good way to kind of cover up other problems. So if your lawn has a problem with uh, chinch bugs or an undiagnosed disease, if you put enough fertilizer on it and enough water, the grass is still alive, it's going to turn green and it's going to grow. And you may think that, oh, I've solved the problem, I've made things better. But the disease is going to continue to progress and it's only going to get worse. And now all of a sudden your entire lawn is going to die. And unfortunately, overuse of homeowner fertilizers on lawns is a cause of many different environmental problems. And as time goes on, they're only going to be restricted more and more because here in Hernando County, we do have a fertilizer ordinance where during the months of January, February and March, homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawn. So if people don't kind of break the fertilizer habit and try to solve all the problems with fertilizer, what will most likely happen is those restrictions are only going to become more restrictive and people won't be able to use fertilizers as much as they have in the past. So you only want to fertilize your lawn when you have a good reason to, not just because it doesn't look good and you're assuming, well, more fertilizer is going to fix it because honestly, that's never the correct solution. So those are my top five myths and the top five, I guess, misconceptions that I run across at work most often, you know, helping people on the phone or through email or through photos or whatever it might be. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen there and come back in here and turn on my two co-hosts. And I think that's about all I had, guys, for my yeah. favorite, most commonly heard top five lawn and garden myths. Yes, um, I think us too. Um, Karen, could you go ahead and give us um, your phone number and email for those who are watching? Sure. The phone number here for Hernando County Mosquito Control is 352-540-6552. And we ask that you give us a call if you're experiencing any um, mosquitoes in your yard. Our guys will come out, they'll do an inspection, find the problem, and um, either help you to take care of that problem or take care of the problem while they're there, depending on whether they're evident while they're there. Um, and the second thing is, if you'd like to email me, you can email our office at www.hernandocounty.us forward slash mosquito or you can do my direct email at kmojica at hernandocounty.us. Do you have um, the banners with our emails, Bill? Do you have that on this? Yes, I do. If you would like to contact Lily with any questions, uh, there is her email right there, lilyb at hernandocounty, all one word, dot us. And there is my email also, wlester at ufl.edu. And please feel free to um, send me an email with any lawn and garden questions you might have. And if you're, if it's a myth, I'll tell you very nicely and we'll get, it <laughs> up, get you back on the right track to solving your problems. I, I once heard a horticulture agent, um, somebody came and told him that what my barber said, <laughs> I should do this. And by the time they were done talking, 
the horticulture agent agreed not to cut the man's hair if <laughs> if he stopped getting um, horticultural advice from his barber. So sometimes we just need to know the right place to turn. Exactly. And, Very good and, advice. Yeah, and any of us will be glad to help you. If we don't know the answers, we know lots of smart people who do. Exactly. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I think that will be it. And thank you very much for listening to us today. And we will see you again next week for other classes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.